Section 21 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aria Lipshaw. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. Section 21, Selected Scenes by Aeschylus. The Complaint of Prometheus, from E. B. Browning's translation of Prometheus. Prometheus Alone O holy ether and swift-winged winds, and river wells, and laughter innumerous of yon sea waves, Earth, mother of us all, and all-viewing cyclic sun, I cry on you, Behold me, a god, what I endure from gods. Behold, with throw on throw, how wasted by this woe I wrestle down the myriad years of time. Behold how fast around me the new king of the happy ones sublime has flung the chain he forged, has shamed and bound me. Woe, woe! Today's woe and the coming morrows I cover with one groan. And where is found me a limit to these sorrows? And yet what word do I say? I have foreknown clearly all things that should be, Nothing done comes sudden to my soul, and I must bear what is ordained with patience, being aware necessity doth front the universe with an invincible gesture. Yet this curse which strikes me now, I find it hard to brave in silence or in speech. Because I gave honour to mortals, I have yoked my soul to this compelling fate. Because I stole the secret fount of fire, whose bubbles went over the ferule's brim, and manward sent art's mighty means and perfect rudiment, that sin I expiate in this agony, hung here in fetters neath the blanching sky. Ah, ah me! What a sound, what a fragrance sweeps up from opinion unseen of a god, or a mortal, or nature between! Sweeping up to this rock where the earth has her bound, to have sight of my pangs or some guerdon obtain, lo, a god in the anguish, a god in the chain. The god Zeus hateth sore, and his gods hate again, as many as tread on his glorified floor, because I loved mortals too much evermore. Alas me! What a murmur and motion I hear, as of birds flying near! And the air undersings the light stroke of their wings, and all life that approaches I wait for in fear. A Prayer to Artemis from Miss Swanwick's translation of The Suppliants. Strophe 4 Though Zeus plan all things right, yet is his heart's desire full hard to trace. Nathless in every place, brightly it gleameth e'en in darkest night, fraught with black fate to man's speech-gifted race. Antistrophe 4 Steadfast, ne'er thrown in fight, the deed in brow of Zeus to ripeness brought, for wrapped in shadowy night, tangled, unscanned by mortal sight, extend the pathways of his secret thought. Strophe V. From towering hopes mortals he hurleth prone to utter doom, but for their fall no force arrayeth he, for all that gods devise is without effort wrought. A mindful spirit aloft on holy throne, by inborn energy achieves his thought. Antistrophe V. But let him mortal insolence behold, how with proud contumacy rife, wantons the stem in lusty life my marriage craving, frenzy overbold, spur ever pricking, goads them on to fate, by ruin taught their folly all too late. Strophe VI. Thus I complain in piteous strain, Grief-laden, tear-evoking, shrill, Ah, woe is me, woe, woe! Dirge-like it sounds, mine own death-trill I pour, Yet breathing vital air. Hear, hill-crowned Apia, hear my prayer. Full well, O land, my voice barbaric thou canst understand, While oft with rendings I assail My Byssene vesture and Sidonian veil. Antistrophe six. My nuptial rite, in heaven's pure sight, pollution were, death-laden, rude. Ah, woe is me, woe, woe! Alas, for sorrow's murky brood! Where will this billow hurl me, 
Where? Hear, hill-crowned Apia, hear my prayer. Full well, O land, my voice barbaric thou canst understand, while oft with rendings I assail my Byssene vesture and Sidonian veil. Strophe 7 The oar indeed, and home with sails, flax-tissued, swelled with favoring gales, staunch to the wave, from spear-storm free, have to this shore escorted me, nor so far blame I destiny. But may the all-seeing Father send in fitting time propitious end, so our dread mother's mighty brood the lordly couch may scape, ah me, unwedded, unsubdued. Antistrophe 7 Meeting my will with will divine, daughter of Zeus, who here dost hold steadfast thy sacred shrine, me, Artemis unstained, behold, do thou, who sovereign might dost wield, virgin thyself, a virgin shield. So our dread mother's mighty brood, the lordly couch may scape, ah me, unwedded, unsubdued. The Defiance of Eteocles From Miss Swanwick's translation of The Seven Against Thebes Messenger Now at the seventh gate, the seventh chief, Thy proper mother's son, I will announce what fortune for this city, for himself with curses he invoketh. On the walls ascending, heralded as king to stand with peons for their capture, then with thee to fight, and either slaying near thee die, or thee who wronged him, chasing forth alive, requite in kind his proper banishment. Such words he shouts, and calls upon the gods who o'er his race preside and fatherland, with gracious eye to look upon his prayers. A well-wrought buckler, newly forged, he bears, with twofold blazon riveted thereon, for there a woman leads, with sober mien, a mailed warrior, enchased in gold, justice her style, and thus the legend speaks. This man I will restore, and he shall hold the city and his father's palace homes. Such the devices of the hostile chiefs. Tis for thyself to choose whom thou wilt send, but never shalt thou blame my herald words. To guide the rudder of the state be thine. Eteocles O heaven-demented race of Oedipus, my race, tear-fraught, detested of the gods! Alas, our father's curses now bear fruit! But it beseems not to lament or weep, lest lamentation sadder still be borne. For him, too truly Polynikes named, what his device will work we soon shall know, whether his braggart words with madness fraught, gold blazoned on his shield shall lead him back. Hath justice communed with or claimed him hers, guided his deeds and thoughts this might have been, but neither when he fled the darksome womb or in his childhood, or in youth's fair prime, or when the hair thick gathered on his chin, hath justice communed with or claimed him hers, nor in this outrage on his fatherland deem I she now beside him deigns to stand. For justice would in sooth belie her name, did she with this all-daring man consort. In these regards confiding will I go, myself will meet him, who with better right, brother to brother, chieftain against chief, foeman to foe I'll stand. Quick, bring my spear, my greaves and armor, bulwark against stones. The Vision of Cassandra From Edward Fitzgerald's Version of the Agamemnon Cassandra Phoebus Apollo Chorus Hark, the lips at last unlocking Cassandra Phoebus, Phoebus Chorus Well, what of Phoebus, maiden? Though a name tis but disparagement to call upon in misery. Cassandra. Apollo, Apollo, again! Oh, the burning arrow through the brain! Phoebus Apollo, Apollo! Chorus. Seemingly, possessed indeed, whether by... Cassandra. Phoebus, Phoebus! Through trampled ashes, blood and fiery rain, over water seething, and behind the breathing war-horse in the darkness, till you rose again, took the helm, took the rein. Chorus as one that half asleep at dawn recalls a night of horror. Cassandra. Hither, whither, Phoebus? And with whom, leading me, lighting me? Chorus. I can answer that. Cassandra. 
Down to what slaughterhouse? Pho! The smell of carnage through the door scares me from it, drags me toward it. Phoebus Apollo! Apollo! Chorus. One of the dismal prophet pack, it seems, that hunt the trail of blood. But here at fault. This is no den of slaughter, but the house of Agamemnon. Cassandra. Down upon the towers, phantoms of two mangled children hover, and a famished man, at an empty table glaring, seizes and devours. Chorus. Thyestes and his children. Strange enough for any maiden from abroad to know, or knowing. Cassandra. And look, in the chamber below, the terrible woman, listening, watching, under a mask, preparing the blow in the fold of her robe. Chorus. Nay, but again at fault, for in the tragic story of this house, unless indeed the fatal Helen, no woman, Cassandra, no woman, Tisiphone, daughter of Tartarus, love-grinning woman above, dragon-tailed under, honey-tongued harpy-clawed, into the glittering meshes of slaughter she wheedles, entices him into the poisonous fold of the serpent. Chorus. Peace, mad woman, peace! whose stony lips once open vomit out such uncouth horrors. Cassandra. I tell you the lioness slaughters the lion asleep, and lifting her blood-dripping fangs buried deep in his mane, glaring about her insatiable, bellowing, bounds hither. Phoebus Apollo, Apollo, Apollo! Whither have you led me under night alive with fire, through the trampled ashes of the city of my sire, from my slaughtered kinsman, fallen throne, insulted shrine, slave-like to be butchered, the daughter of a royal line. The Lament of the Old Nurse From Plumptree's Translation of the Libation Pourers Nurse Our mistress bids me with all speed to call Aegisthus to the strangers, that he come and hear more clearly, as a man from man, this newly brought report. Before her slaves, under set eyes of melancholy cast, she hid her inner chuckle at the events that have been brought to pass, too well for her, but for this house and hearth most miserably, as in the tale the strangers clearly told. He, when he hears and learns the story's gist, will joy, I trow, in heart. Ah, wretched me! How those old troubles, of all sorts made up, most hard to bear, in Atreus's palace halls have made my heart full heavy in my breast. But never have I known a woe like this, for other ills I bore full patiently. But as for dear Orestes, my sweet charge, whom from his mother I received and nursed, and then the shrill cries rousing me in nights, and many and unprofitable toils for me who bore them, for one must needs rear the heedless infant like an animal. How can it else be? As his humour serve, for while a child is yet in swaddling clothes, it speaketh not, if either hunger comes, or passing thirst, or lower calls of need, and children's stomach works its own content. And I, though I foresaw this, call to mind how I was cheated, washing swaddling clothes, and nurse and laundress did the selfsame work. I then, with these my double handicrafts, brought up Orestes for his father dear. And now, woe's me, I learn that he is dead, and go to fetch the man that mars this house, and gladly will he hear these words of mine. The Decree of Athena From Miss Swanwick's Translation of the Eumenides Hear ye my statute, men of Attica, ye who of bloodshed judge this primal cause. Yea, and in future age shall Aegeus's host revere this court of jurors. This the hill of Ares, seat of Amazons, their tent, what time gainst Theseus, breathing hate, they came, waging fierce battle, and their towers upreared a counter-fortress to Acropolis. To Ares they did sacrifice, and hence this rock is titled Areopagus. Here then shall sacred awe to fear allied, by day and night my lieges hold from wrong save if themselves do innovate my laws, if thou with mud or influx base, bedim the sparkling water not thou'lt find to drink, nor anarchy nor tyrant's lawless rule commend I to my people's reverence, nor let them banish from their city fear, for who among men uncurbed by fear is just? Thus holding awe in seemly reverence, a bulwark for your state shall ye possess, a safeguard to protect your city walls, such as no mortals otherwhere can boast, 
neither in Scythia nor in Pelops's realm. Behold, this court August, untouched by bribes, sharp to avenge, wakeful for those who sleep, establish I, a bulwark to this land. This charge, extending to all future time, I give my lieges. Meet it as ye rise, assume the pebbles, and decide the cause your oath revering. All hath now been said. End of section 21 Recording by Ariel Lipshaw in New York City